Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Yeah. Oh, Bill boy, welcome back, my power people. Hello, it's Hanging with Mr. Douglas time. Today, as we wade through Chapter 20 of Ingo Swan, Secrets of Power, Volume 1, today is a doozy, because this chapter is thick. It's great. It's full of great info. It's just thick. The title of Chapter 20, Evocative Power, Intelligence, and Smarts. Sounds great, and it is. I am not going to attempt to tap on each amazing, shimmering piece of treasure that Ingo has in this chapter alone. I will do my best to touch on the main stones popping out of the lake to get us to our excerpt. And this excerpt from this chapter, and there's only one, but this excerpt includes the definition of intelligence from the New Columbia Encyclopedia, published in 1975, that Ingo cites to make a big point. This big point. Spoiler. We don't really know how to define intelligence. Seriously. Just hang with me. Walk down this road with me, okay? It is wild. Now, Ingo shows us what he's discovered most dictionaries define intelligence as. One of two things. One, the capacity to apprehend facts and propositions and their relationships, and to reason about them. Okay. Two, the use or exercise of intellect, especially when carried on with considerable ability. Again, we're, we're asking the dictionary, hey, can you tell me what intelligence is? And the dictionary comes back at you and goes, well, it's the capacity to apprehend facts and propositions. Well, uh, what does that mean, dictionary? I don't know. If you were intelligent, maybe you'd already know and you wouldn't have to ask. That's the general vibe I'm getting from the dictionary. Already, these definitions bring up more questions, right, than they do answer about our initial question, which is, what is intelligence? Questions like, what does apprehend mean? Really? I can infer a meaning, but when I'm talking about defining something, I would like to know a, a pretty crystallized definition. And what's the difference between intelligence and intelligent, as well as intellect? The use or exercise of the intellect? is what intelligence is, so then what's the intellect? Ah, uh, this is this chapter. The great thing about Ingo, and one of the reasons why this chapter is as dense as it is, is that he goes into it and breaks down many of these words that lead us on this breadcrumb trail in hopes of finding some understanding. He does open the chapter by discussing evocative power, in reference to the chapter's title. And he does make a point, first defining evocative, as something that calls forth, that summons up. It's an active, experiential thing. It isn't a passive, intellectual understanding. Please hear my air quotes. And Ingo says that if understanding doesn't trigger or stimulate or activate or initiate vitalizing empowerment processes, then whatever is involved won't really become enabled, you know, activated. We then get a reminder that if someone wants to keep us depowered, they're going to be exerting considerable energy to ensuring we don't experience much of anything that would be truly evocative. And evocative can also be thought of as something that is innately interesting to humans. Oh, what is that? What's the, what are those lights in the sky? What's the deal with the whole Sasquatch thing? And like dog-headed people. I mean, you know, the list is huge. Psychic powers. Hello? Hello! <laughs> now here we are skipping stones across the lake to get to where we need to get to so we can get to the excerpt. Ingo throughout this chapter discusses certain topics like the evocative nature of smarts, street smarts, acumen power, keenness of insight powers. It's a good chapter. Smart intellect, smart intelligence, he goes deep, he goes wide. And it is a frame of mind expander to be sure. Okay, now we can start to build up to the excerpt. We'll start with this curious case of confusions surrounding the nature of intelligence. You know, intelligence is definitely something that can be nurtured and was given a lot of attention during the 19th and 20th centuries. <laughs> As it turned out, extremely little of proactive accumulation of how to energetically nurture intelligence at its base in growth-oriented ways, according to Ingo, has actually occurred. In other words, it hasn't really occurred much at all. Take a look at our schools. 
Just take a look at our schools. But truly, preoccupations with defining oneself uh, via one or another fleshbag level attribute and emotional reactions. That's not thinking, that's a reaction to anything that might differ from your chosen team. And those fight videos, those are freaky. It's a wild situation, especially because our species kind of values intelligence as one of our defining factors, but we're not really doing anything about it. Now, as you might be able to tell, I am USA-centric. And just to give an example of how things might be a little different on the other side, we can take a look at TikTok. Okay, the algorithm here seems to have an eroding effect on people who use it to any great degree. Attention spans, they're not doing so hot. Scrolling for hours, teens are picking up ticks because they're trending. It's a big list. And uh, this info is coming from a 60 Minutes report. In China, the algorithm shows kids science experiments they can do at home, museum exhibits, patriotism videos, right or wrong, it's not tick videos or Tide Pod videos or endless amounts of dancing videos. Some of them are very, I mean, some are very talented, not going to lie. But in China, they limit the amount of exposure to TikTok to 40 minutes a day. The report called it the spinach version of the algorithm versus the opium version here in the U.S. So, okay, there we go. Living in crazy times. Going back to intelligence. It's a pretty precious commodity, like power. Hmm? And so, there's going to be some hard limiting and rail guarding on intelligence, just like power, as we've discussed before. This brings us to our excerpt, where we get a definition that seems to slip around defining intelligence. And then, look out for that real juicy part in the middle about how psychologists prefer to define it. Oh, get ready. Let's take a bite. Alfred Binet, the French psychologist, defined intelligence as the totality of mental processes involved in adapting to the environment. Although there remains a strong tendency to view intelligence as a purely intellectual or cognitive function, considerable evidence suggests that intelligence is an attribute of the entire personality that cannot be measured adequately in isolation. It is generally accepted that potential intelligence is related to heredity and that environment is a critical factor in determining the extent of its expression. Please note the references to potential intelligence and what may or may not be involved in determining the extent of its expression. Also note the omission of the idea of nurturing potential intelligence. The concept of intelligence has proved to be so elusive that psychologists often prefer to define it as that which is measured by intelligence tests. While no consensus of opinion prevails about what such tests actually measure, their use in education has had great practical value in assigning children to suitable class groups and in predicting academic performance. Note that there are no grounds for questioning the efficiency implied by this last, rather slick statement. Ooh, tasty, right? Yeah, <laughs> there we go. So, first, it's that intelligence is really the totality of mental processes and an attribute of the entire personality that can't be measured adequately in isolation. Then, we get to that gooey jelly center where psychologists saying they prefer to define intelligence as that which is measured by intelligence tests. What? That is some tight turning circular logic right there. And it gets even better with the powdered sugar portion telling us that while there's no consensus of opinion about what those tests, you know, the one that psychologists use to define intelligence by measuring it, those tests have great value in putting kids into class groups and segments, categorizing them basically and predicting academic performance. Here are my air quotes. In a word, gross. 
You can tell I am kind of uh, moving quickly through this information because it is a lot of information. And thank you for hanging. I appreciate you. It's a wild and, again, thick chapter. Well worth it and a definite mind expander. I was just blown away at the story that Ingo summarizes around IQ tests in this chapter. He does go into more depth dissecting the psychology definition, its failings, lots more. To wrap it up, a little personal story. I, when I was young, I didn't comply with the way school wanted me to behave as a kid. I wasn't a bad kid. I just didn't do any of my homework for like two years straight. Second and third grade, I would forget my backpack. I would. I would just, oh, right. That's why I'm here. I would go because I was having a good time with other kids. I was having a blast. We're playing make-believe. I had, at one point, 26 girlfriends in second grade. Yeah. (laughs) It was fun. School was fun because I wasn't doing school at all. I was having a great time. I was not paying attention in class. I can tell you that. But so it became a problem in that. Day after day, I would come up with more and more clever ways of saying, oh, what, homework? Oh, yeah. You know, mom got a promotion. We went out to eat. I forgot. Oh, my cat is old. It peed all over it. Nice little twist to the dog ate my homework. You know what I mean? You know, various uh, excuses over and over and over again. Two years. Long time. Pretty clever, I would say. A neat show of smarts. Anyway, it got to be such an issue that the teachers called my parents in. It became a thing. There were threats of military school being thrown around. But I had to go take a series of, like, psychological evaluations. And uh, at one point, I had to take an IQ test. And I remember being told what the IQ test was, what it was going to prove, and what it meant for me, depending on how well or not well I did. And uh, I, I recall. Basically, pinning all my hopes on my parents chilling the F out and accepting me for who I was and not thinking I was stupid, not me thinking I was stupid, if I could just get a good number on this IQ test. Well, I took the IQ test and I came back and I got like, I don't know, 103, 105. I was, it was not, I wasn't um, mentally handicapped in any measurable way according to the iq test which we now know is total bunk but according to that number i wasn't anything special either and one of the things that the iq test wants you to know is that that is your number that number ain't gonna change and as a kid that that hit that hit and i took that with me for a long time that defined who i was for a considerable portion of my childhood moving forward. And I remember sitting in the car next to my dad and like having the results with the number and it was just quiet silence. And I remember thinking, oh no, my dad thinks he has an idiot for a son. (laughs) It's not funny, it's sad, but it is funny in that, oh my God, that's terrible. That is heartbreaking. Uh, damn. Not the case, not the case at all. We're having a great time these days. But that, I mean, talk about a negative impact uh, from a test that isn't even recognized as measuring anything of consensus, but is simply used to categorize arbitrarily. And uh, I, I'm, I know Ingo makes the point at some point, but uh, I just want to add, also is a great way to screw with your mind frame. Boy, there's no better way to make someone feel dumb than to give them an arbitrary test that doesn't mean shit, but everybody agrees on means a whole bunch, and you do poorly on. Well, I guess I'm dumb now. Thanks, test. Wild. So if you ever took an IQ test and your number came out lower than what might be celebrated, fear not. It's a bunch of baloney. (laughs) And that dispelling of that bullshit is a wonderful way to reframe your mind and open up to what would have previously been a suppressed portion of your innate power. It certainly was for me. 
yet another reason why I'm oh so thankful to be able to narrate and discuss this information. And again, if you have enjoyed this information and you want the full scroll in your ear, I have narrated the entirety of Volume 1 of Ingo Swan's Secrets of Power. There should be a link in the description. You can find it on Audible. You can find it on my website, mrdouglas.com, M-I-S-T-3-R-D-O-U-G-L-A-S.com. And if you want to be supercharged more by this amazing man and his wonderful treasure trove, check out ingoswan.com, I-N-G-O-S-W-A-N-N.com. Well worth your time. Thank you for spending that valuable time with me. It is a pleasure to be here together to dispel the BSIQ tests and move on more and more empowered with each breath that we take and each test that we can give the middle finger to. (laughs) Thanks for hanging. More power to you.